Money is really the grease in the wheels of the business. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome back. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a smashingly successful small architectural practice. My name is Enoch Sears. I'm the founder of Business of Architecture and your host for this episode. Today, we have the amazing opportunity to be joined by one of the one of the small practice owners who has joined us here at Business of Architecture uh, to implement the smart practice method in her practice. Her name is Molly Wheelock, and she runs Studio MW, which is a design and planning firm based in Paonia, Colorado, founded in 2017. Uh, Molly has a great story. She's a fifth generation Coloradan. She was raised in a small mountain town in the Rockies, and she finds that she's most at home in the rural West, and she has found a niche serving these communities in design and architecture. She's the daughter of a builder, and she gained experience as a framer as a teen, worked in a cabinetry shop on a landscaping crew while attending the Rhode Island School of Design. Molly earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts and Bachelor of Architecture at RISD, which is the Rhode Island School of Design, where she founded Green by Design, later A Better World by Design, and helped lead the school's entry in the DOE Solar Decathlon. Since returning to the West 15 years ago, Molly has worked in the field of architecture and planning throughout Colorado, southern Utah, northern Arizona, and a brief stint in Portland, Oregon. She's continued to focus on sustainability and energy efficiency for their their projects while designing and managing custom residential, equestrian, light commercial, and interior design projects. Uh, Their works can be found in the foothills of Denver, the Alpine Valleys of the Rocky Mountains, the canyons and deserts of Utah and Arizona. So it was a couple of years ago that Molly found Business of Architecture through the podcast, and she recognized that there was probably an easier, simpler, and better way to be able to run the kind of practice that she wanted to run. So she reached out to me, us here at Business of Architecture, and ended up joining our Business of Architecture Smart Practice Program for small firm owners. And so today we're just going to bring her on here, and uh, you'll get to hear from another firm owner like yourself about what it takes, some of the challenges facing small firm owners, and how Molly is taking Studio MW forward uh, to achieve her vision that she has for herself, her life, her team, and her firm. One thing I absolutely love about Molly's work is that she brings a very, very fine and keen eye for design, particularly capitalizing on the majestic landscapes of the American Southwest. She brings a very high caliber education in architecture and design to the table, and she's able to provide this opportunity, these skills, and this level of design to what would normally be underserved communities. And uh, she's really making an impact in her area, so I'm very glad to have Molly on the show today. Hello, Molly, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, so, so good to have you here on the podcast. And uh, you have a, a very unique and interesting practice. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you're located and just kind of the, the climate and the region. And when I say the climate, I mean kind of the, 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 what it's like to practice where you're at. What is your practice about? Yeah. So I am based in a small town in Western Colorado called Paonia, Colorado. It's um, in what we call the North Fork Valley. So, um, we're kind of on the edge of the western side of the Rocky Mountains, bleeding into the desert landscape that people are familiar with, maybe around Moab and Canyon Lands. And that in-between area is um, quite a bit of ar- uh, agriculture, mesas, uh, river basins, um, very beautiful, beautiful area. We're pretty close to Grand Junction and Montrose. Um, so a lot of ag some mining, uh, pretty rural, but we also have some pockets of resort ski towns nearby, um, quite a bit of commerce in Grand Junction and areas like that. But um, it's also a lot about the landscape um, out here and kind of um, how each, you know, everybody kind of recreates differently, but that's a big part of, I think, most people's draw to be out here and, and my draw too. So, I mean, we have mountain biking, hiking, skiing? What are some of the big outdoor activities out there? Um, yeah, uh, rafting, whitewater rafting mm. and kayaking. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely backcountry hiking, backcountry skiing, snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Um, we are more in the mesas area, so we do a lot of cross country. And then, of course, snowmobiling um, and hunting is big, fishing, um, 
-hmm. yeah, we're lucky to have a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And then how did you end up in Peonia? Because typically uh, architectural practices usually are more met metropolitan areas. How did you end up there? Sure. Well, I'm um, from a small mountain town in Colorado, closer to Denver. Um, but I'm I'm always drawn to the smaller communities. I think I just um, think, for example, I'm sitting in a radio station and was able to just walk down the street and um, you know connect with those people and get this great spot to do this interview with um, from KVNF. And um, so having those kinds of relationships is just hugely valuable to me personally. And I really think they help um, a business, especially a small business, thrive. Um, Peony in particular has just always been on my radar. It's a very farm to table um, community. And I think also it's well situated for our work because our practice generally ranges from the uh, western side of Denver in the mountains, uh, the foothills there, um, through the Rocky Mountains in what we call the western slope here, and then out into Utah and kind of the Canyonlands area down to Zion National Park. So this is kind of the in-between without actually being like in Canyonlands. That's probably the middle. <laughs> mm. so. Sounds sounds incredible. Sounds like my kind of place. Now, <laughs> tell me, Molly, what was it, uh, what were some of the challenges that you were dealing with when you reached out to me uh, originally? Um, you can take yourself back to down memory road a little bit. <laughs> well, let's see. The first time I was introduced to you was through the podcast. And um, I had just started my, my company. I had um, done project management in the past with other firms and was ready to um, not just lead my own projects, that was definitely a driver, but also have um, the ability to kind of uh, write my own life and, and career and kind of shape how I wanted to practice. Um, and so I was traveling a lot between Zion National Park, where most of my projects were at that time, and back to Colorado. And also, honestly, in, in kind of panic mode, I had just started a business and had no idea what that really meant once I got out there, what the business aspect was. And um, I had observed and I learned some things, you know, sort of what I didn't want to do and, and some what I did want to do, but how to do it, I didn't understand. And um, so through, you know, kind of listening to other people's stories, mostly I just realized I wasn't alone and that... Um, you know, these panic moments, which, you know, happen at different times throughout a business and a career, um, are natural. And we just, you know, I was able to kind of calm down and just start to take the steps towards building my business. Yeah. And that's when I, when I was in a good place um, to be able to make that next step of really leveling up um, was when I reached mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. What what do you remember some of the specific challenges that you had at the time? Was it were they were they financial things? Was it um, challenges with project delivery? What were some of the challenges hiring? Do you remember what the specific ones that you had at the time? Yeah, well, I think that the the initial panic came a bit from this um, everything all at once feeling, where I suddenly wasn't just managing projects; it was dozens of things I had to keep track of. Um, and just having, I didn't have any process in place. I didn't have anyone helping me. Um, so suddenly I felt very overwhelmed by that end and I wasn't able to focus on the design aspect. Um, I've had some great um, associates along the way, some um, folks who have helped build Studio MW. Um, but it was, I think I was challenged to learn how to, um, to lead and not just lead other people, but to kind of lead myself and lead the business and to put myself into that mindset. Um, and a lot of it was just confidence. I think that the, um, we didn't chat, we weren't, we were very lucky. I, I kind of inherited some projects from, uh, my previous client, Peter Stemple, who, um, kind of shifted careers and shifted back to the East Coast. So I, I had plenty of work, 
and great clients. Um, it was really just kind of how to keep everything on track um, and keep up with everything. So, um, and of course it all has to happen, but it just was a method of taking one thing at a time and slowly building kind of that framework. Mm -hmm. If that, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Well, one thing that we see a lot of times with small practices is that they'll take on perhaps more work than they actually have the bandwidth to handle or within the constraints of, of what they can take on because they don't have the right forecasting or they don't have clear insight into how much ab availability or, or, or resources they have to take on projects or other times just because it's like, well, if a project comes along, I better take it because who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? Uh, you, uh, have you ever experienced anything like that in your practice, Molly? <laughs> I okay, think I'm still learning that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no is a good word for everyone to get really comfortable with and still working on it myself. Um, but that's, that's a big part of it is, yeah, understanding how much work to take on at a time and how much bandwidth I really did have to give each project um, and knowing when to hire. And um, we are at a really great place now, but we've, you know, kind of slowly, I, but we, um, as all of the collective people that have been a part of Studio MW, have kind of slowly built um, a little bit more of a delegation screen streams. And I tend to work more now as kind of an overarching manager and a, you know, kind of a creative director lead, but um, have learned to give a lot more, um, you know, leadership and freedom of expression to the people that work with me. Mm -hmm. What have been the most impactful uh, things for you with what we've helped you do here at Business of Architecture as you've worked with us directly for you? Oh, um, boy, there have been a lot of really positive changes. Um, you know, I think that starting out with just a mindset that is, um, you know, based on um, for one, integrity and showing up and um, kind of knowing um, knowing what your, your capacity is and also being authentic and knowing when, um, when something's not right, you know, whether it's a project or a client or, a, you know, an HR kind of thing. Um, and I think just having confidence in that um, is a good, was a good foundation um, and that this is the right path for me. Um, but I think that the other aspect of that is understanding our value and what we're bringing to our clients and, um, recognizing that we provide something that's actually really quite unique in this area. Um, there are plenty of great designers and, and architects that are nearby, but in our little pocket, um, we get to have a lot of, um, opportunity, a lot of choice, because we are kind of the, the main practice in our region. And um, I think that's also helped to um, recognize that we do provide something that um, clients are seeking out specifically. And um, so we provide a value that, um, you know, is, is, is worth investing in. And um, we've really built a practice that um, I think our, our fees reflect what we bring to the table and reflect a higher level of, um, of design, of site consideration, and of um, kind of a client experience. Um, so I think that's been a big part of it is, you know, we're kind of just building this, this platform um, that is a little different than where we started, which was a desk in my, you know, second bedroom and um, kind of just flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> yeah. So. And you recently, you did this, uh, you took the team on a retreat. Tell us about that, kind of what inspired that. And that's a pretty big move for some at your scale. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, um, so my, my team right now is, is awesome. We're, we're tiny and mighty. We have um, myself, we have uh, my colleague Jeremy, and uh, my colleague Mara. And I've worked with both of them separately in the past. And that 
was a really great place for us to start working together again. We we kind of gotten past a lot of um, you know figuring out how to communicate with each other and understanding each other's strengths and um, areas for growth. And so um, yeah, Jeremy is another designer here uh, just over the pass um, in Glenwood Springs, and Mara actually uh, is a Chilean designer. She's based out of Santiago. Used to live up here in the North Fork Valley. And um, we've been working together for a little under a year, all the, the three of us as a team. Um, but pretty quickly, we realized we just had a um, really great um, base of values and um, kind of where we'd like to see our work go as a, as a team. And um, I know the value after these years of having not only really um, – really talented designers, but people who are, are committed and have, um, you know, a, a, a view towards um, their community and building a firm that is, um, works well together and, um, you know, really wants to make a difference uh, in, in how we, we practice. So we had a great year. Um, we've... Um, decided that uh, we it was time for us to all be in the same room. And I got plane tickets for um, the whole team, and we all got together and went down to Santiago and had a great retreat down in uh, northern Patagonia. We got a little Airbnb in, on an island down there, and just um, really it was about having conversations about what our values are individually and as a group. And then building off of that, thinking about, um, kind of the next steps for the company. Yeah. Amazing. What are the next steps? Where is this going? Where is it going? <laughs> What's the vision, Molly? Um, well, the the vision is always evolving, but um, something that we keep talking about since our, our retreat a few weeks ago is um, think differently. And what we mean by that is, you know, we run into whether it's how we practice, you know, the practice of architecture is based on a lot of um, tradition, you know, there's a lot of um, formality to it. There are, um, uh, for good reason, there are techniques and details that are well established. Um, and then there's also um, the way that we approach, um, say, site conditions and things like that, and how we build build the form and the and the aesthetic of the of the building. And all of those things we're looking at as how we can think differently about them, not just um, function out of routine. And it's a really broad statement, but I think it applies to so many things. Whether it's um, how we communicate with our clients, um, how we engage in our community, and how we engage with each other. Um, and I think it stems from um, ins that desire to bring um, that added value and to really understand the problem and find the correct solution, not just the immediate solution. Um, I know I'm, I'm speaking kind of in a vague way, but it applies to so much of what we do. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from some of our previous values, which were... Um, like a, a, a curiosity, wander and wonder, which is one of them. And I think that's just, it keeps us fresh. It keeps us wanting to be designers and, and learn more about a project or learn more about a client. And um, so I know that's very open-ended, but that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of um, creating a new value set or an updated value set. And um, as a model for our, our company, you know, we work very much um, out of respect. So there's mutual respect among the three of us and giving each of us that voice um, as designers and leaders. Now, let's, uh, let's talk about money a little bit. What For you, yeah. what's the role of money in a practice and how do you view money in a practice? What's the Molly um, Relock philosophy of money? <laughs> I think I'm still learning that one. Um, 
Well, I'm getting much a much more comfortable relationship with money. Um, you know, to me, there's um, money is really the grease in the wheels of the business, and that's something I'm learning is that I I cannot run the business well um, and and really thrive. The business doesn't thrive. I don't thrive. The, um, uh, my team doesn't. If for one, we just don't have decent revenue. Um, on top of that, um, in order to provide the services that we want to provide to our clients, we need time, we need to continue to learn and, and educate ourselves, and uh, we need to be able to bring in other consultants, hire potentially to um, increase that value that we're giving to a project. And so we've gone from this model that was um, originally just you know time and materials, hourly basis, to recognizing that we're providing a, um, a service that is not just about a drawing set. And um, so we've, we've moved into more of a fixed fee model. And we've also just began to be realistic about um, what our overhead is and what the profit is that we need to make to continue to grow. And, um, you know, we're not we're still very low compared to a lot of our competitors. Um, we're not out there trying to, um, you know, overestimate or anything like that. We're just trying to build a sustainable firm and um, that has sustainable growth, steady growth, not booming growth. Um, and that takes money. That takes having savings and making a profit and continue to continuing to reinvest in ourselves. So. Um, and how would you say that your viewpoint on money has been either challenged or changed through your work here at Business of Architecture? <laughs> um, well, I think that probably like a lot of folks, um, you know, you want to provide something that's affordable and accessible. And I think I was challenged because I, I, I've always wanted to provide something that everybody can, can appreciate and access. You know, design for all is one of our values. And I, I've worked with Habitat for Humanity. I've volunteered time um, and design work. And I would love for great design to be in everybody's hands. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that it's free. <laughs> and um, I'd love for, it to, for my services to be affordable to everybody. But the reality is, is that um, we're, a, we're a hefty investment for our clients. We are an important part of um, what they're building, whether that is their dream home or it's the desire to, you know, our practice doesn't do... Um, institutional work currently, but, um, you know, even in that scenario, that, that is more than just about the drawing set, like I said. So it's, I think we've changed, I've changed personal, personally from this place of, um, you know, what's the bare minimum that I can charge to make this accessible to my client, whether they can afford it or they can afford 10 times of that. I just wanted it to be bare minimum to now recognizing that um, there needs to be the added value of that growth. What's the next project? You know, how do we how do we provide better service? And um, and also recognizing that um, I have more to give. I have more to give when I'm not stressing about the money. Um, so I think I I. Um, don't feel as much of a, a barrier there, you know, to the to making money personally. So I feel more comfortable with that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, thanks. Thanks, Molly. Molly is one of our <laughs> heroic firm owners in the Smart Practice program right now. And Molly, it's, it's as always, I'm so grateful you came on here to the podcast to share about uh, your your studio, what you've been up to, uh, showing other other small firm owners uh, a little bit behind the scenes of what it's like to go on this journey. Well, thanks for having me, Enoch. It's been fun, and um, 
love connecting with all the architects that are, you know, on your podcast. It's, it's uh, always great information and, and encouraging to the work we do. So thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.